Jeff Hansen is one of our favorites. Yesterday he tweeted uh, at Rakoto10. Uh, Did I just buy the perfect BYU shoe? Colorway, brand, price, utility, personality. Are these not the perfect BYU shoe? Of course, these would be the Air Monarchs. He then tweeted in all caps in uh, true Guy Holiday style. We are Air Monarchs and tan cargo shorts and blue shirts with corporate logos. We sing popcorn popping. We smuggle candy in the, into the stadium in our pockets. We roll up on game day in minivans. We eat leftovers before the game to save a buck. This is us and these are our anthems. And I would add, this is the way. Jeff Hansen now joins us on BYU Sports Nation, of course, of Cougar Sports Insider on 247sports.com. Amen and amen, Jeff. We are who we are, man. We talk about how we're a peculiar people. Let's just lead into it. You know, Taylor <laughs> Swift fans, they go nuts. They, they spend all their money. They line up and break Ticketmaster to go to a Taylor Swift, Swift concert, and they're applauded for it. But we're, we're, we're mocked because we wear Air Monarchs and blue and tan cargo shorts? No, we are who we are, and we need to embrace it. Look, I, I am all in for <laughs> leaning into who we are. Look, you cannot tell me that if we brought back for football games singing popcorn popping. I want to throw some tortillas on the field. You cannot tell me that the opposition wouldn't be freaked out wondering what in the world is going on. It is an advantage that we are not taking advantage of anymore. I completely agree. I mean, is it really like way less dorky to do jump around at Wisconsin than to sing Pop, 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 Pop and Melly yes. is, is the line really that thick? I don't think those songs are that far off. These are the same. And, uh, of course, Keaton Slovis on Friday came into BYU Sports Nation, and he was rocking the Air Monarchs. This guy fits in here perfectly. That's my quarterback, man. That's my quarterback. <laughs> All right, let's talk about non-Air Monarch things, although we could talk about that all day. Uh, okay, cer certainly we were just having a conversation about the role of NFL draft picks in BYU. Are we going for quantity, or would we prefer maybe there are fewer but higher picks? What's your opinion in BYU and the NFL draft, which is coming up later this month? Yeah, for me it's quantity, right? I mean, every kid dreams of being drafted in the NFL – and you, from a recruiting pitch, from purely a BYU standpoint, being able to go to a recruit's house and say, hey, look, we've had, you know, 20 recruits that have been drafted in the last X years, that holds more weight than, hey, there's been two or three first round picks. Both hold weight, both are important, and you want them to have NFL success. But I think that getting kids drafted is a better testament of what BYU can offer than NFL success. Having success in the NFL it was a testament to the hard work of the player, NFL coaches, things like that. But if BYU's job is to get players to the NFL, then I think you want to have more NFL draft picks than, than fewer higher picks. What do you make of BYU's draft class this year? I think most of us assume that if BYU is going to have players drafted, you're probably going to get three. Do you think mm -hmm. BYU gets the three? And obviously we're talking about Freeland and Puka and Jaron. Do you think all three are drafted or, or where do you stand on that? Uh, I think Blake Freeland and Jaron Hall are locks for 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 sure, and I, I'm about 95% sure on Puka Nakua. Uh, Puka's just had such an interesting career, right? I mean, he struggled to stay healthy, uh, really dating back to his time at Washington and then at BYU. When he's on the field, he's electric. Uh, I, I think he gets drafted probably day three, uh, but I, I I do think that there are going to be a, a certain number of NFL teams that that are are maybe a little hesitant to draft a guy with injury history uh, just because the wide receiver class, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of really talented wide receivers going into the draft this year. And I also think Caleb Hayes, I think BYU could sneak a fourth uh, Caleb Hayes, even before his pro day uh, showcase where he really just stole the show. He looked really good at the NFL PA bowl. He, he, he graded out really well there. He had the longest arms. He was already kind of impressing people with, Hey, he looks six, like 5'11", six foot. He's not the biggest, tallest guy, but he was manning up really big physical receivers, and he was able to showcase what he did at BYU, breaking up passes with his length and, and things like that. So his his pro day kind of like brought everybody, like all the fans, to the, the Caleb Hayes bandwagon. But I think NFL scouts have been on that train for a little while already, and pro day was kind of a cherry on top. So I think we could see Caleb Hayes sneak into the, the third day of the draft. Yeah, as soon as he ran that 4 3 1, I was like, did he just get into the seventh round? Uh, 19 PBUs the last two years certainly helps as well. Um, the transfer portal is going to open up. Ooh, the portal. Uh, April 15th through the 30th. You got to at least get your name in there, right? And then you can.
go wherever, whenever after that. Um, where does BYU need to bring in impact players uh, on a team that is in its first year in the Big 12 from the portal specifically? You know, it's really going to be interesting to see how, specifically on the defense. I think the offense, the answer is easy, Jerem. I, I think BYU needs some help at wide receiver. I, I actually used this analogy with somebody the other day. Uh, BYU doesn't need to find a Cody Hoffman. They don't need to find an Austin Colley out of the transfer portal. Uh, they, they've got three really good wide receivers that in most years throughout the last 10 or 15 years, you're really, really confident in the top three wide receivers in that room. What BYU needs is they need that Taron Houck. They need that, you know, Mitchell Jurgens type, that that third or fourth guy who, who can fill in in a pinch if somebody gets hurt, but is also just there to be super reliable when somebody needs a playoff. So I think on the offensive side of the ball, wide receiver is a, a known priority already. On the defensive side of the ball, I'm fascinated to see how Jay Hill wants to use the transfer portal. I think he's going to go and, and add as much talent as he can, regardless of position. But I think there's a couple of positions where he probably needs to add some bodies, specifically corner, a lot of youth and inexperience. It's not to say that BYU doesn't have talent there, but they don't have a ton of proven experience outside of Eddie Heckard and Jacob Robinson. Uh, so I think corner is probably a priority. And then the defensive line is really tough to know what Jay Hill is, is thinking. Um, there's a ton of experience there, but it's a dramatically different scheme. And those guys are being asked to do dramatically different things. So how have they shown in Jay Hill's eyes, right? How have they showcased their skills throughout spring ball? Does Jay look at that and say, hey, we, we, we've got the guys we need. We can make a run. Or is he looking at this and saying, wow, BYU really was loaded with a bunch of two gap defensive linemen and we need gap shooters now. And they've got to go add two or three. Um, I, I think they could go out and get talent there, and I, I think they need to, but I haven't been in practice in spring ball to see what's going on as those guys adjust to a, a brand new scheme and brand new coaching. And then at linebacker, it's interesting because you like Ben Bywater and Max Truly, of course. These guys are pick six potential on any play, as we saw. But behind them, not a ton of experience. Um, you know, we've seen the Kafusis, uh, Ace and Micah have a nice spring and been called out by Jay as freshmen. Isaiah Glasker's had a good spring, we were told by Klein's talking. Those guys haven't played much. So is there a need at linebacker as well for P5 transfers potentially? I, I think there could be. I, I think at the linebacker position, in my opinion, you, you go if there's the right guy. I don't think that you need to go and add a body just for the, the sake of adding a body. But I do think if there is the right name that pops up, there's a couple of guys from, from Utah State is an example that would be difference makers that have connections to the program. If the right guy pops up, you go out and you get them. Uh, but I, I would put that probably lower than corner and defensive line on my personal priority uh, list for the defense because I do trust those Kafusis. Maybe I'm putting a lot of weight into the last name Kafusi, but I, I, I trust Kafusis. And then you look at it, really what Jay Hill did at Weber State you're going to see guys like Ammon Hanneman, Chaz Ayu, hopefully he gets back and he's healthy. Kind of that hybrid position, that, that in-between safety linebacker, you're going to see more of that on the field at BYU. So you maybe don't need the, the, the quantity of linebackers that you did in the past. You need really two linebacker positions and then a third hybrid spot. And if you look at it that way, I, I think there's more bodies at BYU right now that have experience and have proven production that you could maybe get by. But certainly, there's the right name there and there's the, the interest in the program that I think BYU has to go out and get them. On Tuesday's show, Jeremy and I were having the discussion in terms of the balance between how far do you lean into the transfer portal as opposed to, you know, the, the quote unquote uh, traditional way of, of developing the talent out of high school and the recruiting process. Where do you fall on that? Can there be too much of a reliance on the transfer portal? How do you look at that balance? Yeah, for me, it, it, football and basketball, it, when we talk about recruiting and we talk about the transfer portal, I think people have a tendency to want to put football and basketball into the same the, the same basket, and they're not, right? From a basketball standpoint, Jason, I think you nailed it on the head. You can rely too much on the transfer portal, and you need to have that chemistry and all of those things. From a football standpoint, where there's so many guys on the roster and so many players that are rotating in and out and, and injuries and things like that that happen over the course of a 12-game football season, the name of the game is just stacking talent on top of talent on top of talent. And, and so I look at it from a football standpoint, almost like a GM would have to in the NFL, that rosters now, because players can leave so quickly and enter the transfer portal, 
you really have to look at your roster from a football standpoint as a, a year over year roster. So you've got to prepare for 2023, knowing that 2024, the guys you get, whether they're out of the portal or out of high school, they may not be there. You hope that they are, but they may not be there that next year. So you need to, to plan for the immediate year. And then the next year and the future is kind of a bonus where, where basketball is a little bit different because it, it takes so much time to gel. You need that chemistry on your team. Football, most positions, certainly you need chemistry, you know, quarterbacks and wide receivers and offensive line. But football, really, if you're talented, you'll find a way to get on the field. So I think for football, you can go heavy into the transfer portal so long as you always have that nucleus of 10 or 15 guys in a recruiting class out of high school that you think will grow with you for, for two, three, four years. And what other school has what BYU has in terms of, okay, we're tied to a specific religion and there are kids who grow up wanting to come to this school. That's not unique to BYU per se. But it's like that recruiting advantage needs to be mined. And if it's not, I think oh, yeah. BYU is not going to be as good as it can be. So in basketball, it's like, okay, there's some balance there. And in football, you're always going to have the high school recruit. You can't just transfer portal that. And why would BYU? BYU is unique. They wear Air Monarchs. They go on <laughs> missions, right? They, they do unique things. They tunnel sing. They wear socks with sandals. Like, there's all these things we do. I, I am concerned for basketball a little bit that they didn't sign a high school player last year. Maybe the class wasn't good and they didn't have room or whatever. It just feels like three or four years down the road, we're going to go, what happened? Like, why is there not anybody? Jake Wallin comes off a mission. But I mean, like, at least grabbing a kid that's going to be here in a couple of years. It's year to year, but yeah. I'm a little concerned. Yeah, I agree on the basketball front. I mean, it, it, it is strange. I mean, BYU's formula for success, really going back all the way to, to Danny Ainge, has been have a team of upperclassmen. BYU is not a, a school that could just load up on freshmen like a Kentucky can and, and have a bunch of one and duns and then reload the next year. Like BYU is always, even the good teams recently, Jimmer Fredette was a legend. But that team didn't get great until Jimmer Fredette's final year at BYU. They were good, and you could see them get better year over year, but it was that pinnacle of a team that had been together for a, a bunch of years and add in Jimmer Fredette, the legend, on top of that. Most recently, right, uh, Mark Pope's first year, you had a team that had played together forever, and then you sprinkle in some transfer portal guys like, like Jake Toulson, but that core of, of Zach Selyus, TJ Haas, Yoli Childs, that had been together. They'd been together at BYU for years that's been a, a tried and true formula for BYU basketball to have success. And I, 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 I'm with you, Jeremy. It feels like BYU has gotten away from that a little bit. And this year of a class without any high schoolers at all, that's a little concerning. You know, one of the things that we have talked about for a long, long time, once we knew that BYU is officially going into the Big 12, is the recruiting bump. And look, the recruiting bump can be for out of the high school ranks. It can also be in the transfer portal. I mean, you're constantly recruiting. It's recruiting your own players. How much of the bump have you seen already? I mean, the coaches have said they've already had doors open to them now that they've never had open and wouldn't have been open if this opportunity hadn't presented itself. How much have you seen already and how much more do you expect? Uh, I, I think we've seen a ton and I think we'll continue to see a ton. Where I struggle being able to answer that question is, is at the same time of BYU going into the Big 12, they also added Jay Hill and this new defensive staff. So how much credit does Jay Hill get? How much credit does the Big 12 get? I don't know what that pie chart looks like, but the combination of the two, there's been an immediate difference. And, and, and you could see it uh, really throughout all types of BYU recruits. So there's a couple of guys that BYU's hosted on, on unofficial visits in recent weeks. Willie Goodacre is a non-LDS player out of Texas. Came to BYU, loved it. He's got a multitude of offers, and he loved it. He was really surprised by what he saw. That, I think, is a Big 12 bump. I don't think BYU is able to, to bring in a player, even for a visit, like Willie Goodacre, uh, before the Big 12. Nico Clem was just here last week. He's another highly touted three-star defensive back out of California. I don't think he comes to BYU if they're not in the Big 12. But even here locally in the more traditional recruit, uh, a guy like Cash Dillon out of Porter Canyon High School or Davis Andrews out of American Fork High School. These are guys that probably go to Utah in years past. And they may still end up going to Utah. We don't know that for sure. But because of Jay Hill and the relationships that Cash and Davis have with, with the new BYU coaching staff, uh, in my conversations with them, BYU is, is a very big factor in their recruitment where 
six months ago, they were pretty candid with me that BYU wasn't a factor in their recruitment. So how much of it is Big 12? How much of it is, is, is Jay Hill and the new coaching staff? I don't know. But the combination of the two, uh, it, it's a dramatic difference when I talk to recruits in the 2024 cycle compared to, say, 2022 or 2023. There, there's no question about it. Well, that's the kind of bump we're hoping for, right, in the Big 12, that BYU starts to get uh... – continue to get some of the best LDS uh, athletes out there, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and others, which is awesome. Jeff, we appreciate the time. Keep those monarchs super white-souled, scrub them, keep, get them ready to go, because guess what? The snow's going to go away, and we are going to be out there at Applebee's and mowing lawns soon enough. No, oh, yeah, i got to get some grass stains on the monarchs. Otherwise, <laughs> they're not authentic monarchs yet. <laughs> That's exactly right. Thanks, Jeff. We Thanks, appreciate Jeff. the time. Thanks, guys.